in six different counties across northeastern Arkansas, Craighead, Crittenden, Cross, Jackson, Mississippi, and Poinsett. One region. Now, I want to preview something here for a minute. If you will draw your attention to more or less the upper left corner, the area in and around Jonesboro. Uh, this area also has a dire need for relief in the area of teacher shortages. It has a little bit different flavor to it than perhaps the rest of the co-op area and districts do. This area, as opposed to many other parts of the co-op service area, is growing. However, with this growth, still there are challenges. You will hear, I think especially from Dr. Wilbanks here in a little bit, that there are retention problems in these districts, such as, for example, Jonesboro, Nettleton, uh, Brooklyn, and Valley View that while they may be able to attract teachers, they are losing teachers constantly. They're having retention issues, families are moving, there's an area of transience. So even though the districts may differ somewhat demographically, I want to emphasize at the outset that the need is common. Here are the waivers that we're requesting. They're identical for each school district, and they are all teacher licensure waivers. We're not seeking any. Uh, waivers of any other area. I would like to uh, especially point your attention to request number one and uh, to go along with Mr. Manning's comments, I also would like to thank the ADE staff and the ADE staff were the ones who brought the fact that we also really needed number one on the rules governing educator licensure to be a piece, complementary piece of these waivers. The other thing, if I can back up just a moment to the uh, listing of district slide, I also want to explain one thing in your packet that may seem unusual. As you probably have noted, there are two different open enrollment charter schools waivers that we included, and here is why. The district, uh, Gosnell and Armorell draw students, or lose students rather, to Kip Blyville. They are not showing any loss of students, I believe, to Arkansas Virtual Academy as the other members of the co-op are, who are part of this request. As Ms. McLaughlin pointed out, and I think it's key to note at the outset, is we are asking for these waivers for one year only. And as we'll explain in more detail momentarily, the reason for that is we believe that the passage of Act 294, which sets up a new tiered licensure system with exceptions for unlicensed teachers and for those teachers who have content area knowledge in one area to teach in another will help the co-op on a more permanent basis going forward. But as this was just passed this past uh, session, will come into effect on August 1st, but the rulemaking process has not begun. It's really not going to offer any relief for these districts for the 17-18 school year. As I mentioned a moment ago, and Dr. Pfeffer, I think, did a good job of bringing uh, out a lot of the uh, uh, pertinent parts of Act 294 when talking about the Forest City waivers, a couple of the main things that Act 294 will offer to districts through the ADE is the ability to get relief through emergency teaching permits and effective teacher licensure exceptions. And I mentioned that this is something that we anticipate in conjunction with the department will be able to utilize starting in the 18-19 school year once the rules have been fully promulgated and implemented. One of the things we thought was important to bring to you is our assurances that we were going to comply with all, all requirements. So for example, background checks will, will still be complied with, uh, tests will be complied with, we are going to comply with the AQT requirements, and we'll see more about that in subsequent slides. I know one of the things from, from past meetings that you're very um, uh, interested in is making sure that unlicensed uh, teachers receive training. So we're committing to you in the fourth checked point, so to speak, on this slide, that all teachers hired under these waivers will receive training to include ethics. We are also aware of the new Ethics Act that was passed uh, in the 2017 session, which creates a new code of ethics for unlicensed educators, and obviously we work closely with ADE to get our unlicensed teachers hired through these waivers to be trained fully through their processes, and they will receive mentoring and support and training through their own home districts as well as Crowley's op 
uh, Crowley's Ridge programs. Mm -hmm. Finally, working towards licensure, the full intent of the districts is not to have these individuals hired under this waiver be unlicensed teachers on a permanent basis, but will take steps immediately to work them through the licensure process. Uh, again, to reiterate, the AQT requirements will remain. We are not seeking any uh, waiver or diminution of those requirements. Here's just kind of the background as to what that is, just uh, for your review, and the same thing as to what the uh, core academic subjects are. So one of the problems that the districts, or most of the districts uh, in the upper delta and that are part of this request are suffering from is the inability to recruit teachers to the area because that area for the most part is losing population. <coughs> And there has been an inability, as you will see in a moment, despite these districts' individual and collective efforts to re recruit and retain teachers, there's still an inability to them to completely fill their needs through the traditional methods. Here are some things on a more macro scale, so to speak, as to the regional factors at play. Uh, I'd especially call your attention to the uh, one on the far right, the smaller pool of candidates with education degrees. I'll just add to that, you may have noticed in one of the charts that we submitted to you, there was a list of teacher completion, completion programs or teacher licensure programs, education programs rather, and how many students they were turning out. You may have noticed on that chart with uh, that Arkansas State University, which of course is located in Jonesboro, appeared to be turning out a relatively high number of education graduates. And you may have thought, well, why isn't that a remedy or a large part of the remedy of the problem? Uh, one main thing to keep in mind here I have found out is that many of those students are doing their coursework online and many do not live in Arkansas and many do not intend to come to Arkansas after they complete that program. So here is another slide that, uh, that delineates the population growth, although it's increased statewide in the Delta, it has fallen by two and a half percent, also coupled with low unemployment. And so here uh, we've submitted to you a lot of information from the districts themselves as to their particular needs and, and challenges. And of course, many of them are here today if you have questions of them. But uh, as a whole, I want to draw your attention to the first paragraph, especially on this slide. 95% of Crowley's Ridge educational co-op members are currently using teachers on additional licensure plans, long-term su uh, substitutes, and or retirees pulled back into service. And we have one chart in particular that outlines all of that for you for the, for the districts. Teacher shortage impact on member district. Here are some of the things that's the, uh, that are potential outcomes if the teacher shortage issue remains unabated. I want to spend a moment on the first bullet point there. Virtual Arkansas classes will increase. What we mean by that is not anything against virtual Arkansas, obviously, but it diminishes a district to offer fully a, a class with a teacher in the classroom if that is what the student is wanting. We wanted to make sure we brought to attention the efforts that the member districts took to cure this problem without having to come to you and seek an Act 1240 waiver, and you see those listed there on slide 18. And, uh, and some creative efforts they have taken uh, individually and collectively to also try and stem the tide and uh, be able to enhance their pool of qualified applicants to, to come on board. And there's final uh, information uh, concerning job fairs and the various uh, advertising methods and means that the districts have taken. And uh, that's the end of the slideshow, and I'll turn it back over to Mr. Manning for the introduction and presentation to superintendents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning. And just to give you a time check, there's six minutes left. Okay. Uh, Dr. Will Banks from Jonesboro. As Mr. Manning indicated, I'm Dr. Kim Wilbanks uh, with the Jonesboro School District. And you may think I'm an unlikely person to stand before you to request a waiver for licensure. But let me tell you the story of Jonesboro Public Schools. Uh, yes, we sit next door to Arkansas State University, which produces a large number of education graduates. 
and we are pleased to take advantage of many of those quality applicants in our district. We also um, have the highest salary in Craighead County, yet I still stand here telling you that we have a shortage of teachers to fill open positions. Each year we hire approximately 50 new individuals. That is a result of growth that we have experienced in our district each year, a uh, result of retirement, some folks taking off to have babies and transfers of families, husbands and, and entire families. We have utilized every, um, every alternative that um, the Arkansas Department of Education has put out there, including Apple and ALPs, and uh, we're on a first name basis with anybody at the department that can help us with those challenges. Yet last year, we still, even with all of the means at our disposal, had two classrooms that we had to request waivers for long-term substitutes. Uh, to give you an idea of what our picture looks like, I left today and I said I want to confirm exactly how many openings we have today. And they said we have four. And of those four, we have one that we are ready to make a recommendation on. The other three, we'd, which we had just received, we do not have a known candidate at this time. Um, given some time, we may eventually find one, we may not. But before I could get here to speak to you, we have five openings. So we currently are in a time where that, those openings just continue to occur. What I'd venture to say is we have a pool of candidates in Northeast Arkansas, and if I went back and I looked at the applications I have, I have a pretty good number of applications. Most of them currently teach in these districts right here. So if you were to look at all of the openings we collectively have, there are not enough candidates in our area to fill the openings that we have. Um, we've, we've taken on everything we know to take on in terms of recruitment. We've taken advantage of statewide efforts, uh, college efforts, all the way down to efforts at our local school where we host a recruitment fair. And yes, we have 150 uh, approximately individuals who come in. Unfortunately, they don't all come in with the right degrees and the right programs to fill the needs that we have. We've gone as far to hire an individual who their um, sole purpose is just to support new teachers because we know that the amount of time and training that we put in on a new, new hire is a, a large investment and we want to hang on to them. So we believe that's helped. Even with all of those efforts, I feel certain that we will apply for twice as many waivers this year for long-term substitutes just based on the delay that we see in the rules that, that have already been passed but won't assist us in this school year. Um, you may say, you know, what happens? Why, why are you seeing this? Well, it's growth. It's that those families are uh, very transient. And another factor that comes into play is three positions that we currently have open in our district are related to promotions. So employees that were part of the Jonesboro School District were promoted to administrators in a more rural district, which then created an opening, which speaks once again to there's just a limited number of individuals to fill the positions. We're all vying for that same number of limited individuals. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Wilbanks. Uh, Dr. Bennett from Newport. Uh, Commissioner Key, he promised me he wasn't going to mention mentoring. <laughs> <laughs> I might change my mind. Larry Bennett, Superintendent of Newport Schools. Um, we're a very rural school district in Northeast Arkansas, and as Dr. Wilbanks says, we surround, mostly schools surround Jonesboro area. Our school district, our community, is about 30, 35 minutes from Jonesboro. Same thing with Searcy probably 20 minutes or 25 minutes to Batesville. So uh, we're in the middle of that triangle, but yet uh, we have to get teachers and people who live in those areas to try to come to Newport and, and work in our school district. Uh, we are losing students. Uh, we're big, obviously, in the ag agriculture area and um, migrant situation. Uh, we do not... Uh, have easy recourse to find teachers. We do everything that you've already seen here today, uh, but we still have a hard time finding, especially in the core areas. 
I'll tell you, we do everything we can to find teachers to come to Newport and work. Uh, financially, that creates a problem for us in the sense that uh, when we can't find those teachers, we start cutting programs. Uh, one of the things that we have done at Newport is we've asked for and, and received the opportunity to become a school of innovation at our high school. And I will tell you, my sole purpose on doing that is for teaching. Because you've already heard several waivers here today requesting class size and those kind of things. That's exactly what we're doing in Newport. So that we can, we have less teachers that yet we can serve more students. Um, I don't know what all I can tell you. I think you're very well aware that they, we have a shortage of teachers in, this, in the state, probably across the nation. It's getting harder and harder to get people to go in our teaching profession. A lot of issues with that, uh, whether it be money or whether it, uh, uh, whatever social issue you might want to bring up. But uh, finding quality teachers and come out to rural areas is very difficult. Uh, we can give them all the greatest kids and all the greatest classrooms, but we still can't satisfy all their needs as a human being. But rural schools have a major problem. Uh, I don't think I can stand here anymore and say more and more and more of that same issue. But uh, our kids deserve an education also. So we'd ask you to consider allowing us to have these waivers so that we can provide quality education for every child that we teach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. That's our, our program for our waiver. So we'll turn it back over to you for questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Manning. And, and that's at time as well. So um, perfectly Thank rounded you. off. Uh, just for due diligence um, and our last one of the day, Ms. McLaughlin, if you can kindly confirm no public comment or opposition. No public comment or opposition. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. So with that, we will open it up to the board. Questions or comments? I will say something that they didn't say, which is even though some of the people who major in education and are getting out the colleges or don't have them well prepared to pass the praxis test. So even if, you know, so we need to lean on the deans and the colleges of education too to uh, be sure those students can pass the test once they get their degree. That's a very good point. And we've talked about that amongst ourselves, but we appreciate you making it. Additional, yes, Commissioner. Mr. Manning, one of the interesting things about the Southeast Co-op um, group that kind of started the, the ball rolling on this, uh, the Co-op regions coming as a group asking for waivers, they had uh, a very strong partnership with the uh, with UA Monticello. Yes, and the UA Monticello uh, aspect was a, a pretty key, I think, in the board and certainly for the department looking differently at what they're asking for. I understand that UAM has um, their education program has some different aspects that may not be there at ASU. Just curious, uh, when on page 19 it talks about the think tank at ASU on addressing shortage, what type of uh, discussions have been going on there and ideas? That Maybe coming out of that. Kim, you want to talk about? I attended the Education Renewal Zone meeting at Arkansas State, uh, I think it was last week, and they are making concerted efforts to increase the number of students that are in their education program and, in fact, it, anticipate enrollment next year to be the first year that they've seen an increase instead of a decrease in the number of students who are ed entering their education program. Is that primarily because of recruiting, or what? What are they changing anything structurally in their program? Uh, what? What? How are they? What are they attributing that to? Uh, I'm not certain. They did not. They did not go into elaborate on that. I know they have been in the process of some changes. Um, as the licensure has changed, it has also um, made some changes in their programming, and it did um, create some some numbers, some differences in the numbers of graduates. They have also, um, Richard was pointing out to me, they've also um, really um, helped develop strong teacher cadet programs in many of our schools that are looking at 
high school students, recruiting them into those education programs, and then eventually into our um, into our pool of candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wildings. And I think Dr. Pfeffer, did, did you have more to add? Thank you, Thank you. Any additional questions, <coughs> questions or comments from the board? And then um, for, this is a question for Ms. McLaughlin or, or Ms. Davis, who I don't think is there, but, um, so Ms. McLaughlin, you're it. Um, the only topic, waiver topic here, correct, is teacher licensure. The all seven yes. fit within the topic of, so we can just um, have one mm -hmm. uh, motion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. So with any additional questions or comments, or I will entertain a motion. I move that we approve the uh, 1240 waivers for the Crowley's Ridge uh, co-op. Second. Motion made by Ms. Sook, seconded by Dr. Hill. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Best of luck, and thank you for all 20 districts for thank being here. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing thank from you. you. Thank you. Best of luck. That would be so supportive. Um, so with that, we will take a 10-minute break. Um, I know it's been a long afternoon, um, and it is a marathon. So we will reconvene at 4:20. 4:20.
Uh, moving on to action agenda item B10, standard accreditation appeals, probation hearings um, that have been scheduled today. Um, presenter uh, will be Mr. Morris. Uh, Mr. Morris, you are recognized. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I was hoping that it wouldn't be this late before <laughs> I got up. Uh, however, uh, I'm standing before you. Uh, I'm Willie Morris. I'm the program manager for the Standards Monitoring Unit. Uh, we have three districts that have uh, sent in appeal letters. Uh, they are Bryant, Woodlawn, and Greenwood. And uh, Bryant is the first one on the agenda. I don't know how, which order you want to take them, but uh, I'm here to answer any question you, uh, as it relates to each one of those individual cases. And uh, I have some of the specialists here who work those uh, school districts. Thank you, Mr. Morris. If, if you could be so kind as to remind us, we, we will take it um, in the order um, that they are presented here. And then just for the purposes of the board, um, I know it's been a while since we've had these, we will, we'll take each of these individually. Um, so these will not be taken together as a collective. But if you could kindly remind us, Mr. Morris, of the procedure for these hearings, um, are they allotted a certain amount of time to speak or is it just questions on our part? Maybe Ms. Uh, Salas Ford, if you uh, could be I so light. I would, uh Defer to our attorneys. To well, we'll let the, the attorneys uh, speak. Thank you, Ms. Salas Ford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, any persons wishing to testify before the board shall be placed under oath by the chairperson. Uh, both the department and the appealing school district will each have 20 minutes to present its case to the state board with the department going first. The chairperson may allow additional time if necessary. The state board may pose questions to either party at any time during the hearing. The State Board shall then discuss, deliberate, and vote upon the matter. Thank you, Ms. Alice Ford. Um, so with that, um, uh, as we uh, commence with the Bryan School District, I'll ask that anyone planning to offer testimony who's not an attorney, if you could kindly raise, stand at this time, raise your right hand so that I may swear you in. Do you all swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, so with that, to the department, you have your 20 minutes. Okay, it won't take that long for us to present our case. Uh, during the uh, accreditation cycle, we have an initial accreditation cycle and a final accreditation. Uh, and uh, it was found by the specialist that Bryant uh, had uh, issues with class load, which was a probationary vi violation. Uh, Bryant uh, had uh, asked to uh, come before the board to appeal that designation and to explain to you why uh, they wanted to. And, uh, but that was found during the accreditation cycle and uh, they're here to uh, state their case. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Uh, with that, um, individual speaking from the Bryan School District, Dr. Kimbrell, if you dare. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Best that, possible way to end my <laughs> time here. I just Maybe appreciate the fact that I get 20 minutes with y'all as my <laughs> final. And if you take it all. <laughs> but thank you, Madam Chair, uh, State Board Members, and Commissioner Key. Uh, one, let me thank you for your service. Uh, I know what you deal with. Uh, I've, I've sat up there with you, and I don't think people understand the public service that you provide and it's a thankless service. So from my heart to, to you, thank you for what you do for the kids of Arkansas. And I know you don't get the accolades or the thanks that you deserve, so I wanna say thank you. Uh, secondly, Madam Chair, thank you for the kind compliments earlier. I do appreciate that, and yes, I remember when you began this, this, uh, <laughs> this journey on the state board. The Bryant School District is before you today and ask in the appeal of the initial probationary notification from the standards monitoring unit of our Bryant Middle School. That initial probationary status is due to our assignment of more students per class and four of our, excuse me, five of our pre-AP pre teacher classrooms this current year. In August of 2016, Bryant Middle School Principal Todd Sellers, who is here in case you have questions, came to Dr. Walters and I looking for a solution for 15 of our middle school students. These students were trying to take one or two pre-AP courses and they were faced with the option of taking either the, the desired pre-AP course or 
an extracurricular course that they were looking at, whether it was athletics, band, choir, uh, robotics, they were going to have to make a choice. I accept full responsibility as the superintendent of the schools that my guidance led us to this particular juncture. I suggested, because we had no other options, we had no space to add classrooms. It's difficult at the end of August, 1st of September, to find qualified pre-AP teachers that instead of these students having to make a choice of being in a pre-AP class versus being on the robotics team in the robotics class, on the band or in the band or choir class, that they would, we just see what happened. My responsibility, I accept that responsibility. Each of these five teachers were approached and asked if they would be willing to look at doing this with no more than two or three additional students for a couple of courses, a couple of periods, and they more than willingly said they would be glad to do that. We, of course, appropriately have compensated those teachers using the formula of more than 150, and I can tell you none of these five teachers had more than 150 kids per year. Many of these kids, our teachers, excuse me, had sections that had 22 kids in them, 20 kids. But one or two sections, they may have had 31, 32, or 33 students in that pre-AP course. This was, again, simply to try to help these students with that decision. Well, really, help these students not have to make that decision. Even with the vast experience that the good Lord's given me in this business, I gave that advice to our principal to allow those students to do that. And to be real honest with you, I didn't realize that that was against standards. I knew they couldn't have more than 150, and I knew that if they did, we could compensate them under the law. So I accept that responsibility, and what we're here to do is to ask you to look at the situation that thankfully you uh, have given us a waiver for the next five years that you allow us two things. One, a waiver for this current school year and that the district not be, or excuse me, the school not be put on probation. I've got Mr. Lassiter with me. He is our Director of Human Resources and Legal Services and he is going to provide you with what we believe are options that you have as the State Board to allow our school to uh, be, I guess, not put on probation for this violation. Mr. Lassiter. Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Key, and members of the board, it's good to be back here with you. Um, earlier today, uh, you approved a five-year waiver for our school district under Act 1240 uh, for this exact uh, same reason, the class siding teaching load just for our uh, AP courses. And so what we're asking you to do uh, for this agenda item is to do the same thing but only under a different section of law than Act 1240. Um, so the Standards for Accreditation laws and rules, they allow you as a board uh, upon a showing of just cause uh, to waive a standard for accreditation for one year. And so that's what we did in our letter uh, to uh, Mr. Morris and Commissioner Key. We asked for those two things that Dr. Kimbrell mentioned. One, uh, that you would waive uh, that standard for this year on, for just and reasonable cause. Um, and uh, on the basis of that waiver for this year, not hold us to be in probationary status uh, for the 2016-2017 school year. Um, and so uh, I guess it, to, to wrap that piece of it up, at the end of the day, if you approved our request, we would have the standards waiver for this year and then the waiver that you granted us earlier today uh, going forward. Uh, the law allows you all to do that, and we're asking uh, that under these circumstances that there is, has been a showing of just cause and the fact that we simply did not have additional classrooms in which to hire new teachers and to put these children in those classes. Uh, we had to make the hard decision to go ahead and allow them to, to be in class as Dr. Kimbrell uh, laid out for you. So are there any questions for me at this time? I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Lassiter. Um, and does anyone else wish to speak on behalf of the district? You all still have 13 minutes left. All right, then I appreciate that. Um, with that, we now open it up to questions or comments. Uh, I guess my question is, what is the, the downside of being on probation? 
uh, the first year of probation, there's no real downside to it other than being labeled in probation. Uh, the second year, then it could be a, a problem for them. Uh, but uh, with their request to appeal, uh, you, they may want to answer that. I'll let Dr. Kimberly answer that question as to what's the downside. He's coming toward behind you. Ms. Ellis Ford may want to talk. Did you want to speak more to the legal implications, Ms. Ellis Ford? Really, I can just reiterate what Mr. Morris already said. Um, if you did not grant the waiver, the Bryant School District would be in year one violation that permits the state board to take action but does not require you to. Um, and so it, that would just be up to you whether you chose to take action on that. Okay, and Dr. Kimbrell, uh, would this in any way impact uh, the district as far as, I know you have new millage and selling of bonds and those type of things. Would that be held against you uh, wh when that's looked at? It could be, yes ma'am. As a matter of fact, as we, we've completed our, our uh, questionnaire for bonds, that's one of the questions that we have to answer. We told our uh, fiscal agent that uh, we could be, but at this point we're not on probation, but we do have uh, uh, one pending. So we're waiting for your decision. So it could be and have some impact on our ability to I don't think to sell the bonds, but the interest rate in which the bonds would could be sold. So it does have some fiscal impact. Uh, the big issue is the second year. You know, once you've had two years, two consecutive years in probation, uh, there are uh, some dire could be some dire consequences by you as a group to our school district. Not that we want to. Uh, I think we'll have another year, but if there is some way that we can. Uh, get you to understand why we did what we did and the cause for the reason, then we would rather not take that chance of having two years of probation well, if having, something came having up. having taught a long time, I understand the concept of forgiveness rather than permission. I, <laughs> I get that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Barth. So um, this is uh, for legal, maybe uh, Ms. Alex Ford. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the kind of retroactive waiver that 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 uh, uh, that Jeremy uh, kind of voiced a request for. Um, at, could 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 the district have come at any point and asked for that? Uh, they or? could not have asked for a waiver of the standard until it was a finding by the standards unit. They could have asked for a 1240 waiver, such they have right, done sure. now, but not for an actual waiver of the standard until the finding was made. Okay. And so, so that that leaves me to add, uh, Brian, um, kind of on the the timing of when when y'all figured out this was a problem, and I, I something tells me you probably figured it out before. Um, maybe you didn't figure it out until till till the citation. But uh, when did you figure out that there was a problem? With I just this? asked that question, Dr. Walters, and it was the end of April of this year. Okay, so very late in the game. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barth. Additional questions? Yes, Ms. Newton. I, I guess my question, I don't know if it's for legal or for the board or, or whatever. If we approve the waiver, does it open a door for um, others to do the same? They get in trouble and then they come and ask for a waiver after they've gotten in trouble. I mean, I'm just asking the question, so. And, and, and just to, to offer, it's not uncommon. I feel like every year we get at least a, a few of these that will come before us. Everyone has the rights to be able to appeal um, a, a finding. So this is, this is something all districts are aware that they have the opportunity to do. Um, and we have, at least I know in my time on the board, given waivers before. Um, for for special circumstances, um, uh, not to say we uniformly give it just because somebody has asked, but we we have given them before. So, uh, Ms. Salas Ford, I don't know if you, there's more you would like to elaborate on that. No, this is same. Anytime there is a finding um, of probation, we send them a letter notifying them that they do all have the right to appeal under the law. Ma'am, if I could yes. just say one thing, and I, Mr. that's, that's an excellent point that you make, Ms. Newton, about you know not wanting to open the floodgates in situations like this. I would just ask the board to consider that the law does require in those cases that someone come to you and show just cause why that needs to happen. It's not just something that people would do as a matter of course. They would have to have what, in, in your estimation, would be uh, just cause in order to grant that waiver. Dr. Barth. 
And I and I, I guess I come down. I, I, I just have I appreciate the uh, the demeanor uh, that the Bryant District uh, brought, but I'm I just have can't hear. I haven't heard a reason. Um, I haven't heard cause, um, and so that's that's why I I think it this really could have the potential to uh, become a precedent that really could uh, cause us um, some trouble and would be uh, ultimately uh, create some equity issues um, down the line. Yes, I, I could Lassiter. be happy to address that too. The cause, um, Dr. Barth, would be somewhat along with the same lines that you heard earlier today of why we requested the waiver in the first place. But more importantly, I think what a school district would normally do in a situation like this would be to go ahead and try to hire additional teachers and accommodate the students that way. Uh, in our case, even if we had hired additional teachers, we didn't have a classroom to put them in. I mean, that's how full we've been. You, you've seen some of our, uh, you saw some of our uh, uh, comments last year to some of you regarding our uh, school choice uh, situation. We simply did not have a classroom to stick them in. And so, um, you know, we could have addressed the situation that way. It's just a, a reality that we're trying to address with our millage now, with new construction to be able to find room and to add these additional classes. And I, uh, and I, pre I appreciate the, the, the uh, challenging situation you all have faced. Uh, but I do think this is a different scenario. Let's imagine it's the middle of the year and a student transfers in. I feel like that's something that's kind of beyond the district's control. I think that um, the district, you know, just made a made a choice here, and um, and I uh, and I, I I just re regret that it it it, it just feels um, it feels problematic to to let this to let this go. Dr. Barth, I think uh, you're right. I mean, if if you're looking at November December. Please understand, in, in our school district, we have a tremendous number of people who move into our school district in late August, September. They enroll their students. Uh, we had a lot of pressure from our parents for these opportunities for these students to take this more rigorous curriculum. We've been trying to change the culture at Bryant Middle School. We have two middle schools. We have Bethel and we have Bryant. There are some, <coughs> some, uh, so some socioeconomic differences between those two schools. So we've been really pushing at Bryant Middle School to get the curriculum expectations and the number of students that we're trying to get to take pre-AP uh, to get ready for AP courses at our high school. So it was the, is we had more and more kids move into our school district wanting these courses. It wasn't just, well, we're just gonna blow off the standards. We really thought as long as they weren't over 150, we're still good. But when standards came in, did the review of the schedules and, and the printouts of students, they brought it to our attention that they didn't have more than 150, but you can't put 31, 32, or 33 students in a class. And so it wasn't just, we just chose to make that decision. It was a decision that, that came through my office and I truly felt like that was not gonna be a problem that none of those teachers were going to have over 150. So to me, the cause was to give these students an opportunity not only to have this curriculum, but also to be able to choose these other courses that were available for them. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, don't go away, Dr. Kimbrell. So had you known it earlier in the year, what would the choice have been? What would the, the potential decisions, if I hear you right, it would have been, you would have had to close those classes Yes, sir. Kids. We, we would have had at least 15 we're talking about 15 students we would have had 15 students who would have not been able to take pre-AP courses or they would have had to drop uh, band robotics choir uh, athletics etc they were going to have to make a choice of, of those uh, opportunities okay thank you commissioner additional questions And then um, as, as we start getting ready for a motion, either um, Mr. Morris or Ms. Ellis Ford, uh, the appropriate motion here would be to accept or deny the appeal, correct? Yes. Okay. Hey, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to say that um, all this conversation is, uh, is important. We certainly want to make sure that, uh, that uh, we keep an equity lens at this. And we also want to make sure that when schools are trying to create opportunities that, that that's given a consideration too. And, and just to know that 
you know, the purposes of our system should be, <coughs> number one, to protect students from ill effects of not meeting standards. And so I, I think that's where we have, uh, as an agency, you know, there's certain, certain things that we don't have discretion in that you all do. And so, you know, Mr. Morris and his team, they don't have the discretion to say, well, we, you know, we understand the reasons you're doing this or the reasons you did it, so we can let it slide. That's not within the department's purview, but that's why this appeal process is in place so that you all can make that decision of whether something was done that put, did it put students at risk of harm or, uh, or not. So just uh, uh, know that uh, had we had that discretion in certain instances, maybe things don't get to you, but in this case, we didn't. So I just wanted to give that explanation. Uh, Mr. Harvey and, and Mr. Morris, I think, you know, if I describe that incorrectly, y'all help me. But uh, I think that's why something like this ends up uh, before you rather than something that is a decision made at the department level. What, um, excuse me, what, Mr. Harvey, did you want to say something? Um, Albert Harvey, coordinate for public school accountability. When you're looking at the reasons that were uh, cited by Bryant, one of them that they discussed was population, you know, unexpected growth and shift. That is an area underneath standards when you look at uh, exceptions that exceeding the class size can be granted for unexpected population shifts. It's something that they knew that was coming along, such as they had had pre-registration a year and they knew they were going to have X number of students signing up for a pre-AP course or they got an influx of students that is an area where uh, they could have asked for so there's other options with inside standards that could be looked at to uh, address those issues um, so there's there's various reasons that I believe um, could give you cause to go either direction that you would choose uh, what grade level were you won't know this <laughs> Dr. Kimbrell you may know this Dr. Kimber, what grade level, or, or Ms. Walters, what grade level these were these? Seventh grade. And, and you're not, a, you don't have to have a pre-AP in order to go to AP, right? No, ma'am, you do not have to. Right. It's, it's, it's more difficult right. because you're not used to that rigor and that, the expectations right. that come. Right, and I understand the pressure even for kids to take Algebra one in eighth grade, even though that may or may not, because it's sort of a status thing for parents to have their kid in Algebra in eighth grade. So, I, you know, I, I understand that, but anyway, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any additional questions or comments from the board? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to accept or deny the request of appeal. I move to grant the waiver. So motion made uh, by Ms. Newton to, to grant the appeal and seconded by Ms. Dean. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Uh, may the record show opposition from uh, Dr. Barth. Um, the motion though carries in its majority. Thank you, thank you, and uh, happy retirement, Dr. Kimbrough. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your service. Thank you. Uh, moving on now to um, uh, letter item B uh, under action agenda B10 uh, and the Woodlawn, the Woodlawn School District. Uh, Mr. Morris, once again, you're recognized. Yes, Woodlawn is a little different, and they had two probationary items, one being that they had uh, library media issues, they had an uh, uh, elementary uh, library, and then they had a, a high school library, and they did not employ the second librarian. Uh, their appeal is that they be uh, allowed to use that one library to support both buildings. <laughs> then the second thing they had is they had two teachers who at that time uh, that we did the accreditation did not have licensure, a complete licensure. And they have since, it's my understanding, they have since uh, finished their uh, licensure issues and got it removed. However, uh, at the time we did the accreditation, these were the two probationary items they had at hand, and they are here to appeal those. Mr. 
Morris. And will, will you have anything else to add on the part of the department or we can commence on the 20 minutes for the, the district? We'll leave the time for the district. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Morris. And so with that, anyone from uh, the Woodlawn School District planning to offer testimony, if you could stand at this time, raise your right hand and I'd uh, swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Thank you. Uh, you may proceed. I'm and Dudley Hume, Superintendent Woodlawn. Um, I'm not sure which area you would like to visit with first, so I guess I'll start with the two teachers. Um, with the 1240 waivers, uh, our district is the only district in the co-op that was unable to qualify for that because we didn't have a teach a student that was in a virtual academy. We just found out last week that what now we do. So as of this morning, I'm gonna I've submitted a waiver for next board meeting. So I'll see you next in July. Uh, but um, the two teachers uh, are employed at the CBEC Votec, and we are provided services from them. They are through the Warren School District who has those waivers. So when they hired those teachers, they were given waivers. Their students are okay. Our students, since we don't get the waiver, we get the hit. We weren't aware that those teachers weren't certified, but it did bring up a good point that the uh, director is since retired this year. And while we were interviewing during the interviews, I was asking each one of them that if they did become the director, that I want them to make sure that any hires that they have, that before we put a student in that class, that they are that they are qualified because we are subject to that and you're not so and had we known early we probably would have taken care of that situation but due to circumstances we didn't find out till um, a month or two ago uh, the library situation uh, we are a small school so we have one campus uh, though we are high school 712 and k6 Everything is centrally located. We have uh, one library um, and one librarian. And with the numbers, it's 600. But since the accreditation report came out, we found out that if it's, since the elementary had 311 and the high school was way under the 300, it didn't matter whether you had way under the 600, it was if you were at 300 or above in either area. So, uh, mm -hmm. But to show good faith, we have a full-time aide that helps with the librarian, and we have just, well, any day now, are going to complete a brand new library media center that we've just built. Of course, you've seen that when you came down on your trip. So we do take it serious. Uh, we didn't realize that was a red flag at the time. It's an area that we can't take care of, but we do take it serious. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Um, did, will anyone else uh, desire to offer testimony? Just me. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so with that, um, questions or comments from the board? So did these students leave your school, go to Warren Charter to get this class, or, or did those teachers come to you? Well, we do have it through virtual, and we do actually transport students in the morning time, yes. So. They're your student attending the charter for that class at Warren who does have the waiver. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hook. Additional questions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion um, to uh -huh. accept or deny um, the request of appeal. I move that we uh, accept the appeal and I don't know what I'm supposed to say that's Mrs. It. Kaufman yeah. no that's correct <laughs> okay. that's that's good All right. that's good uh, do I have a second okay so motion made oh. on, on both actually if on we could issues. just just a note um, oh, on both that will apply to both okay so motion made by Ms. Book seconded by Ms. Dean uh, discussion Dr. Barth no, I'm, I'm, uh, any other discussion? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. See Congratulations. You we will see you in July. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on to the Greenwood School District um, and their own consideration of appeal. Um, Mr. Morris, once again, you're recognized. Okay. The Greenwood situation is similar to uh, Woodlawn in that they have library media issue. Uh, if 
by the numbers, they were, would have been okay. However, Greenwood decided to open a new LEA this year, and uh, they uh, separated their ninth grade from their high school students and called it the Freshman Academy. In the Freshman Academy, when you have a new building or a new uh, LEA, you're supposed to have a libra provide library media service, and uh, Greenwood wasn't aware of that and uh, until we did the accreditation, and so that's how they ended up here appealing. Okay. Thank you, and um, I think somebody hit uh, the light over now, there. Thank you all. Uh, the specialists uh, for both uh, Woodland and Greenwood are here. Uh, if you have questions specifically about that, that they actually ran the accreditation. Uh, but uh, that's the basic, uh, my basic understanding of what went on with their accreditation and why they received a probationary uh, violation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Uh, so with that, anyone from the Greenwood School District planning to offer testimony, if you could stand at this time and raise your right hand like to swear you in. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. And if you could kindly state your name and title for the record, um, you have 20 minutes. Um, Kevin Heslin. I'm Assistant Superintendent at Greenwood Schools. Uh, if you'll remember, um, on May 11th, I came and gave a very, very brief um, uh, testimony about our Act 1240 waiver. And basically what's happened, we've built a freshman center and in trying to uh, give our taxpayers the best bang for their buck, we were able to attach the freshman center to our high school. So essentially we're operating like a 912 high school. Our freshman center is attached to the building so we didn't have to replicate services like cafeterias, libraries, all that, but it does operate under its own LEA number. In that, we've been able to ask for some waivers and do some creative things like our Bulldog Learning Academy and stuff that's just for that actual LEA number, but we do share the library. I'm really not asking for anything more than a, uh, you guys to approve our appeal because we do continue to use that library. We just can't code one librarian to two different places. And that's kind of where we're at on that. So if I would entertain any questions the board would have. And I saw Dr. Uh, Harvey back there shake his head. I, I don't know if you have anything to, to add uh, to this on behalf of the department. Just uh, in agreement, the way it's set up when you have a separate LEA, even though if they may share the exact same building, because of the way standards are currently written, you would have to have a specific library and meet the uh, ratio for hiring. It's the same situation Woodlawn is specifically in. Um, more toward Greenwoods if they would have come in April or um, February and asked for their 1240 waiver it would have been applied to this current year and they would not be sitting in this situation uh, but because they came last month and the accreditation reports had already been issued we did not have as uh, Commissioner Key has pointed out it's not an early way to grant that at that point it has to then come to the board for consideration but it is something that we do intend to address in our rewrite of standards and how that it's being looked at because our main goal is to ensure that it's a quality education for students and the students are being served um, so in some cases we do see the students are being served and there are just these exceptions so thank you thank you mr. Harvey with that any questions or comments from the board I move to accept the waiver do I have a second, second. Motion made by Dr. Barr, seconded oh, by appeal, Mr. Will. The appeal. The appeal. The appeal. Motion to, we, we understood, and, and for the record, I think Ms. Kaufman, she got us, <laughs> as, as she would say. Uh, so motion made by Dr. Barr, seconded by Mr. Williamson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, and I also want to thank Mr. Morris and his staff. They've been very helpful working us through this process, too. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for coming down, Mr. Heslon. Yes, Commissioner. Um, well, first, I have two things, and while Mr. Morris, yeah, I know he has another item uh, that he's getting ready to present, uh, but I know he'll probably get through with that and he will ease out. So my, my first item, though, is to brag on Mr. Morris, Mr. Harvey, and their team with standards uh, for the work that they are doing because, you know, here are a couple of examples today of things that uh, do need to be updated and our standards and the, the work that they're doing leading us through that effort uh, collaborating we've had a lot of it, great input from superintendents uh, we're consulting with other stakeholders 
So just publicly, I want to express my appreciation to Mr. Morris, Mr. Harvey, all the standards folks for uh, their hard work, not just with their job working with schools, but with their effort in trying to help us modernize our standards of accreditation. So that's number one. Number two is uh, we celebrated a number of folks who will be uh, retiring and uh, Mr. Morris being one of those. Uh, this is going to be his last, unless y'all have a special board meeting between now and the end maybe of the month. We, maybe we could vote on that. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I want to take this opportunity to uh, publicly and to the board express my appreciation to Mr. Morris for his years of uh, work in education and specifically here at the department uh, leading this team and, and the, the work that uh, he's done through the years and just uh, since I've been commissioner his uh, wisdom and advice that he's provided to me uh, at, at different times has been very helpful so uh, I want y'all to know how much he'll be missed yes, he will. Thank, you. thank you Commissioner. And, and thank you Commissioner Key did they, did they turn it on they're trying to get rid of me early. <laughs> now, the actions that you just took have some impact on the uh, item that I'm about to present uh, because uh, we had sent you a final accreditation report that had uh, those probationary issues on it. Uh, we'll have to do some cleanup, and uh, uh, since you granted those uh, appeals, we'll have to do some cleanup, and then we'll make that, uh, this report final. So uh, is your preference, Mr. Morris, that we pull the agenda item until July? Or Mr. Harvey, is, is that what you would do in this specific case? Or would you like us to consider it and just acknowledge that you all will amend as per today's decision? Yes. Could, okay. could you go ahead and consider the agenda item to be amended as a board action taken today. Okay, fantastic. So with that, we will take on action agenda item B11, final accreditation report for this fiscal year. It's a summary of accreditation for Arkansas public schools and school districts. And so with that, Mr. Morris, I know you've offered an explanation. Is there anything more you would like to add on this agenda item? No, it's just that the numbers, the final numbers will change. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that I made notation of that and that you will have a revised report. Thank you, Mr. Morris. And then Ms. Salisford, then just that the, the motion when made would just say to reflect today's actions. Yeah. So yeah, the report as revised to reflect today's actions. actions. Fantastic. So with that, I would entertain a motion along those lines from our colleagues, esteemed colleagues on the board. I move to approve the uh, report for summary of accreditation um, as revised um, according to the revisions for today. Second. Okay. A motion made by Ms. Dean, seconded by Dr. Hill. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And with that, Mr. Morris, also to you, happy retirement. Well, thank you. And, uh, and thank you for your tremendous service and leadership. Uh, one of our former uh, directors gave me some good advice at, my at our retirement reception Monday. He said, after you retire, you can have to keep in mind that every day then becomes Saturday. And I told him I'm going to look forward to some extended weekends. <laughs> Actually, May I ask a question? Every night is like Friday night. Every day is like Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> May I ask a question? Make it sound so good. Okay. Uh, yes, Miss Uh The areas, like there's seven areas, and what does that mean? That's the areas that the super, uh, the specialists are assigned to. Okay, thank you. And, and they are their their areas have changed over the years because we have had some. Uh, retirements and we've also had some people who left the unit okay. and so that but that's the area that they are currently assigned to all right thank you i couldn't figure it out see miss miss Sook was going to make sure you're not going to get let off the hook easy <laughs> had, to, had to get in another question right. thank you for that though miss Sook. and thank you mr Mur and morrison thank you best of luck to you thank you so much uh, so with that that concludes our action agenda for today um, but we do have um, some substantial reports um, to end us off uh, for for uh, this afternoon or now getting close into evening. Uh, so with that, um, we will move into our Dollarway quarterly report. And for that, I would like to recognize, um, and I, I don't know if Dr. Wild is in the room. There he is, I see him. Dr. Wild and then Miss, Miss Warren as well. Pleasure. 
And, uh, and while we're making this transition here, I hope everyone um, can tolerate us. Uh, we would like to let our court reporter leave. And so as she's pulling microphones, um, I, I, with your due diligence, we'll, we'll continue with the agenda. We're not going to take a break. But please know if you need to grab microphones, we, we completely understand. So with that, uh, Dr. Wild, okay. you're recognized. Richard Wild, School Improvement Program Manager. This is the uh, quarterly report for a school or a district under state authority. Dollar Way School District. As you can see in the letter from Ms. Barnes, for this report, what we had uh, requested from the district was to submit a, a written report for your review, kind of capturing how the year has progressed and to do an analysis of the 45 day progress reports and to contrast those reports with uh, their school goals. You have in your packet the 45-day progress reports from third quarter and for the most part fourth quarter uh, is um, a busy time of year so those reports are not typically as complete as they are during the first three quarters of the year. And the intent today was uh, to provide you written information, we've also uh, submitted to you the legislative report that we submit quarterly for your review. And then the intent was just to really respond if you had any questions. And so that said, uh, I'll let Ms. Warren give her comments and then we'll open it up to the, to the board for questions. Thank you. Ms. Warren, welcome back. Thank you so much, and good evening all after a very long day, very long day for you. Um, we, are, we are looking at a, a variety of activities right now that our fourth quarter um, report that'll be into you um, at some point, we have, we have submitted it as of June 2nd. And we are really working to our end of the year data and having a, and having conversations with our um, with our provider. We are working as a district leadership team to discuss at the end of the year data, and we have come to a variety of conclusions. Many of them are tied to the culture climate issues that I think you'll see in our, our reports. We find that. While we have had some progress as it relates to attendance, um, moving in the right direction for, um, for students and also for teachers, it's kind of hit and miss at different times. We are working in respect to culture and climate on some major initiatives that we think with the uh, student and teacher and community feedback will really position us to make the improvements we need. One of those initiatives I want to share with you is tied to the Dollar Way Community School Initiative that I think you, you may have heard a great deal about. We have several uh, members of our community who have been coming together on a monthly basis to give us feedback and to help us to write a strategic plan. We're really looking forward to having that and being able to work more closely with supports. We are going to become a PBIS district. We have submitted our application and done the work related to the perception surveys with students and teachers um, and overviews. We are on track to have a huge kickoff this year with uh, PBIS. That, of course, is going to directly impact morale and tie back to, again, the culture climate issues that we are considering to be one of our major issues. I won't do all the talking today, as I do have uh, principals here as well and um, our deputy if you have any other questions, but I want to highlight some data when we talk about the work that we're, we're looking toward. Um, we've gotten just the last couple of days from our provider data that we're going to be looking at more in depth on tomorrow, but uh, gains analysis data that shows us we're really moving in a positive direction. We will share this information um, in depth, and we have forwarded on to school improvement in the last couple of days as we just gotten it. But we are seeing improved accuracy in phonics and reading. Um, we are also seeing Lexile gains. And um, in a little conversation I had with Dr. Wild, he says, well, you know, you're supposed to see Lexile gains. But we even point to the fact that while 52% of the students met their end of the year goals, which of course is for a year's growth for a Lexile gain, but we also had, you know, somewhere around 30% of students who doubled that, uh, those gains. We're digging into this data and trying to tie it to ACT Aspire. 
we have required the assistance we've asked for, and that has been assistance associated with data analysis. Um, the department's come in, been very, very helpful. We have systems associated with our leadership teams in place that we didn't have in place before, and we're still pretty young in it. Um, however, it is an expectation in our culture that we have weekly professional learning community meetings, be them grade level or uh, being grade level or content level meetings. We are consistent with those as well, the school leadership team meetings and the district leadership team meetings. So we are working to be in the place we need to be. A um, little, little behind, we, we definitely will say. Our literacy instruction, our data showing us is more effective than our math instruction. And we are meeting to work on professional development activities and to tie in the, the right actions to respond to what we see the data saying to us. We see gains. We are still in the process of disaggregating the data and look forward to having more detailed information for you. Now, entertain questions. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Yes, ma'am. Any questions from the board? Ms. Suck? Uh, yes, on uh, the legislative report, page nine, about the math and reading level data for your high school. You know, I don't know if it's been done or could be done or would need to be a charter or a special request or a waiver or whatever, but when we have this many students who are this far, this high percentage of students who are this far behind in math and reading, it would seem that we just need to stop and teach math and reading. You know, if you can't read and you can't do math, then how much you're going to retain in a science class or a history class or maybe you teach reading in the history or whatever but uh, I understand you're doing a good job that your teachers are improving uh, I, I do know that if the teachers came to work more regularly and missed less time that you know I would be happier but because in many cases it's not the kids and if, if, I don't know what has to be done, if it need to be legislation, if it need to be a waiver, if it need to be a conversion charter, an innovation or whatever, but we have got to get in there and teach these high school students and junior high students how to read and do math. We just, we just have to. I don't know what Dr. Weil might suggest or whatever, but it, it with this kind of percentages, the odds of a district getting out of academic distress are not good. And I don't mean that directed at you yes, uh, or saying. the community or the parents or anybody there, but we are not educating these children. And uh, whether it was a problem in the elementary, whether it's a problem in the community, whether it's a problem at the junior high, I don't know where the problem is. I don't even really know that it matters where the problem is. But you don't just get up overnight and not know how to read. So we, we have got to do something, whether it has to come from this board, if it, I don't know what we're gonna do, but this is not acceptable. Uh, and we can get into ESSA and Act 930 and we can uh, talk about growth and all of that. But if I come to ninth grade and I'm more than three years behind, then like you say, I may grow a year. I may grow a year and a half, which is commendable, but I'm still not able to read and therefore I can't study biology on my own. I can't study algebra on my own. And to me, homework is to practice and become more fluent in what you already know. It's not to learn things at home. Um, so, you know, I don't have the answers. I know if we didn't have rules and regs and departments and legislatures and all that, I know what I'd do if I had those kids and we could go off and have our little own community. But, uh, you know, the commissioner, Dr. Weil, somebody, we have got to figure out some way to save these children uh, because their future does not look bright. Even if we are working on 
doing a career and not college regardless and we have those students who are doing well there and who will go to college and who will have a great career but we've got way too many students that are not and uh, no matter how many measures summative measures interim measures growth measures whatever it still it just makes me want to cry commissioner Thank you, Madam Chair. You're exactly right. I mean, and we talk about that internally, and you know that was that is one of the driving issues of of a rise Arkansas campaign. Um, you know, we're starting with K one and two, but in our three year rollout, you know, high school grades are a part of that. And uh, I wish Ms. Smith was here because she said it so eloquently yesterday at uh, the Southwest Co-op down in Hope where, you know, it, it's no longer acceptable for a high school um, social studies teacher to say, I'm not a reading teacher. These kids should know how to read, you know, when they get here. Yeah, they should, but they don't. So we have to give our teachers the tools and, and, and the support to have those uh, those reading components integrated in the other subjects and, and that's something I know the department's been working on for for a while um, the other thing is that it's uh, gotten attention of the legislature Senator Elliott you know had legislation that has passed that um, now all teachers uh, by I think 20 uh, the 20 2021 school year maybe 21 22 help me Ivy which one of those that we are in a process now of developing so that all teachers have at least an awareness and in the lower grades have a specific uh, professional development on the science of reading so that um, you know the numbers reflected here in Dollarway the numbers you're going to see reflected in Little Rock the numbers you're going to see reflected if any uh, many other schools even those not on academic distress you're going to see 25% or 30% or 50% of those kids th three years or more behind. 1% um, is not acceptable. And so we are taking efforts. Uh, it just really becomes uh, heightened in districts like Dollarway. And uh, so we, we continue to work uh, and, and just all, a lot of credit to school improvement folks. Um, to Mrs. Warren and for her t and to her team because you see you know we have some 20 percent improvement numbers uh, here which is good and we need to accelerate that but uh, just know that we need to have the a lot more people saying the things you just said Ms. Hook. folks that are not on the state board need to be saying that and not in a way that's pointing a finger negatively um, at, at, at teachers or schools that's not what we're talking about it's uh, we have to recognize the problem. We have to take steps to solve the problem. And we all have to be in it for the long haul. And that's where I think a lot of times we try to take uh, short-term approaches. So Rise Arkansas is a long-term approach. Uh, the, the reading bills we've seen passed are, are, are long-term approaches. Uh, not to give up on any of these kids that are there now. We're going to work as hard as we can to make sure that, that we get them caught up. Uh, but long term, we want to see these numbers start going down so they don't start out so far behind. But I, I appreciate the recognition of you, Ms. Zook, and this board of saying that. And I don't think Ms. Warren or anybody else takes that uh, negatively at all uh, because I know it's not meant that way. Absolutely. But it's to highlight the, the deep hole that we're in. I and I and that's so, so we, we are taking those and in, 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 in working hard to try to overcome that. I just wonder if we could um, like work with their co-op or work with getting people into this district. It's not a huge district uh, and just you know an intensive during this summer and, and right. teach those people how to teach reading and you know maybe you learn a little bit of biology along the way and maybe that's what you do to make it interesting so you know an older child will want to because you have to find stuff they'd be interested in reading not the spot books but uh, we I mean this is an emergency this is critical I mean I don't even know these kids and it makes me sad so 
help. You know, there are a number of communities in the state that have summer reading programs. Yeah. I mean, I always talk about El Dorado because it's the center of the universe, but uh, there's an excellent one there. I recall well, that we were Lane in, had one yeah, once a couple of years. I mean, yeah, they were working on creating one for this summer right. also, and so I, I think there's, you know, plagiarism is great when it comes to those kind of things. Right. And I know that they, you know, one of the problems that we have in Dollar Way and some other districts is getting the kids to come. Mm -hmm. But we can't help if they come or not. We have got to be there right. to work with them. And if they don't come, then that's on them and their parents. But if we're not even there to try to help them, if we don't come up with something that will work and make it available, then shame on us, in my opinion. Ms. Warren, did you want to speak to your plans for this summer? Um, we will be a part of the RISE program. We are trained and purchased materials. We'll be um, in the training at the co-op and, and purchasing materials. I'm always really careful not to sound like um, I'm making excuses. And so you talk about crying, Ms. Zook. Um, it is hurtful. It, it, it does hurt. Um, these are my little neighbors, my little church members. What we have, though, is a montage of issues. And so I focus on the progress, um, and we can only start where we are. Can't do anything about yesterday. But when you say it is it's something that we should be looking at in a I literally probably said the same words you did in a, in a leadership team meeting. I said, we well, just stop, drop, and read. And um, we talked about math. The teacher retention, recruitment issues are very real issues. And if, I know. if my neighbor district um, way up the street right next door to ASU is having issues, then you know what kind of issues I'm having. So what we're trying to do is have the buy-in of teachers. We are trying to um, tool teachers as much as possible. But consistency, having the same face makes a big difference. But when we don't have the same face, we have really tried to nurture uh, persons who have been long-term subs for us this year and new teachers and really try to, to, to help them understand their, their role and why they are important. I have principals here who are dedicated to Dollarway School District. They have been in this district for a long period of time. Um, but at the same time, they are also in new buildings. Now that's been a neat climate shift for us. Um, and it's been really, really positive and they have been able to do some cohesive things within the building and then work more together among those buildings. That's the first time for that. We're having so many first times for things at Dollarway. So I, just as the commissioner said, I received that. I, 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 I'm saying the same thing with you. Um, but we do have several issues, several, several issues. And even to the point of, of, um, of being in a place where we're ready to, to even report uh, to the detail that we need to. We had a May that really needed our hands-on attention. And a huge, a huge focus for us that we've talked about the entire year is maximizing our instructional time. And we made some decisions that our work would be tied to the disaggregation, tying it from, from data to student, um, and that's the work we're working on this summer. And we have some, some personalized plans that are in place. But I don't mind telling you, I'm not happy about where we are. But I have to say, I'm really happy about the progress and that we are making progress, especially in a district where at, at one point we weren't making progress. So I, I accept that, I understand it, and, and we do feel the same way. Thank you. I didn't yes, see that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So good. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Ad additional questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner. Yeah, just, just to say, too, uh, none of these things stand alone. You know, uh, yes, you heard the work uh, uh, early when we first started out. You know, the, the work that Rocky Malone is, is doing with principals. You know, all of these things fit together. The work that we're doing under Act 930, trying to change that dynamic questioning and helping districts to question how they are spending their money. Just because you've been spending your federal funds, your NSLA funds a certain way, because it, it met the budget, the budget got approved last year, so it'll get approved this year. We're trying to work through that, uh, you know, if Dr. Arola were here, that those uh, cycles of inquiry to make sure that you are 
critically thinking, the th same thing we ask our kids to learn is how to think critically. We have to think critically about how we're spending dollars. We have to think about it at the department. We have to think about it at, at our districts. We have to think about it in each building. And so all of these things fit together. So when you hear us talking about principles and developing principles, we also want school boards and superintendents to think about who they are hiring as principals. Are they the instructional leaders that are going to move us the right direction on literacy? You know, that those are conversations that just know that we are having those and in, in trying to change the way uh, we approach some of the decision making that we have seen in the past. Uh, you know, I, I'm not happy with where we are, but I'm, I'm encouraged about where we're going and I think uh, a shift in thinking that we are starting to see taking hold in the state. I think if we had this conversation again in the next five years, it's going to be a totally different set of numbers that you're looking at. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Ms. Warren. Yes, Ms. Dean. I just wanted to just toss my little bit into the hat um, as far as the what we were talking about at lunch. The parental engagement um, aspect of this is so important when you've got 80 to 90 percent of the children in that district that are reading three grades behind during the summertime this is when it's really important for parents get your child in a summer reading program take them to the library borrow books do whatever is necessary to redeem that time during the summer because so often children just slip further and further behind at, during the summer and then it's the responsibility is laid on the teacher at the beginning of the new school year and I'm looking at the numbers that first quarter there's from 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 one from quarter one to two there's huge gains it's plus 13 plus 10 and then from two to three it's negative three it's negative seven but that's because that first quarter they're so behind then the second quarter the teacher got them caught up a little bit caught them, caught them up from being way behind from the summer and then it's almost like you're trying to play catch up at that between the second and third. So I just want to implore the parents, do what is necessary to help your child. It doesn't, the library is free. The library is free. You can, you can take them to the library, you can order the books and they'll, they'll bring them to whatever library you, you're at or they'll, take them, they'll bring them to your home. There's, there's all sorts of options. Um, do they have, do you have imagination library in Dollar Way? We do not. Well, maybe we, we need to not. find, I know United Way sponsors it some places, uh, churches, chambers. There I was, don't know what all's available to you, but uh, you know, let's. Yes, yes. I want to say one more thing. Yes. The other part of that was not only the parents, but the community. Um, that's what I was just about to say. I don't know, find out what churches, if there can be, if there can be um, um, a partnership with the community and the school district so that these children have some place to go during the summer to get that um, remediation in so many different cases. But um, if there can be a partnership with the churches, maybe a, ch a church can do a, a, um, a literacy program maybe for even it's just just a week and if they, the churches take turns during the summer then that child has somewhere to go during the summer every week but there's got to be more we can't just leave it all on the teachers and the school districts and and the ADE we've got to take responsibility for our own children's education Dr. Hill. Yeah, I just um, echo everything but the problem is really really deep and I say that because when I first moved here in 2005 and, um, and Toyota was going to put that plant in the Delta and did not do so because of the literacy that was so, illiteracy was so high that they refused to put it in the Delta. So what we're talking about children, but it's bigger than children. Because it's a vicious it, cycle. You yeah. see, exactly right. And so, I mean, it's, it's not 
and we're talking about parents and, and, and you know 19 count in 2006 19 counties did not have literacy councils to teach people to read in the delta 19 counties which meant if somebody wanted to learn to read there was no place for them to go in their communities to learn and that was the reason that toyota decided it was an arkansas business they decided that it was cheaper to move the plant to canada because they would have to remake all of their manuals and put pictorials in them to teach. So th this is major when we start talking about basic reading. And back to, you can't learn anything else. I mean, it's intensive that we must get back. This is fundamental, blocking and tackling, that, that we must be able to do if we're gonna learn anything else. But it's hard for us to ask a parent to teach somebody to read when they cannot read themselves. That, that, that's a systemic problem that we have to look at strategies that must be put in place. When we grew up, Sunday school was a place. I remember the Sunday school teacher telling the boy, your phonetics are back, come here after school, we're gonna help you read. Those things are almost obsolete today. So we got to understand, you know, it's, it's, it, there has to be a very strategic mechanism put in place because it's perpetuating itself and we say somebody should do something and you know what needs to be done and we got to take the bull by the horn and we got to get in you know th this is cancer in, in its own way and it's spreading very rapid we have to get a very very strong dose of chemotherapy to help overcome this cancerous cells that are just spreading through our community because it ties back to everything we talk about for discipline crime everything so we, you know, so we got to do everything we can to help. Because I, I understand what you're saying, what your problems are. Almost, you look at it, don't know which, what, what to start. I mean, it's, it's, it's a booger bear, you know? And so, I, I, I Commissioner, you're exactly right, and, and it is big, and, and but we, I just want to say, I, I applaud your efforts, too. I mean, I think that needs to be identified, your whole team, because I, I mean, you, you're, you're facing the booger bear. You know, but we can't run from it because it's our babies that we all, it's all that, miss, that, we, that we talk about. And so we got to save them because if we don't, you know, I think it's really unfortunate that you end up going to prison to get a GED because you couldn't learn to read. But you had intensive therapy in prison, so you learned to read, got your GED, then you come out. But that's not the way that the that's education system is supposed to happen. Shouldn't be a cradle to prison pipeline. Exactly. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't mind, yes, um, just Warren. another moment. I, I won't be long. I have to represent the fact that our community is doing some major neat things right now. And um, we do have so many that are impacted by everything that was, was said, but we have a lot of people who are really trying and we really see a big push in the community to tie more to schools and to take more responsibility. Uh, I think you've heard about the Go Forward Pine Bluff Initiative. That's going to be huge, huge, huge. Um, because we can talk about a lot of stuff, but until somebody throws some money at it, it's going to be really challenging to, to get some things done. And we have some teachers who are phenomenal, but they got to live too. Um, the Dollarway Community Schools Initiative that I mentioned a little earlier, we have had many people to come out from business, industry, church, um, social services, after school programs, a variety of saying, hey, we want to help, we will help. And the organization piece, for us to know who to go to, when to go to, and to the coordination. That's, that's what we're working on right now. So I, I need to represent that um, there are factions of the community, many people um, who are stepping up and who want to help. Stability for us will help us embrace it, and we are seeing it from, from, from local government all the way to our uh, faith-based and even businesses industry. So I, I want to represent the support that we are, are getting and that we are initializing more. And Ms. Warren, um, I'd like to post you and to Dr. Wild as well. I mean, we've, we've been learning. This has been a um, learning as we, we grow, building as we go, right? Because um, you simultaneously, for everything Ms. Sook said, it's an emergency. <laughs> um, the house is burning down, um, but um, you know, there's a longer term strategy. So we just, you gotta start diving in. Is there something that we can be doing differently, Ms. Warren? Is there things that we can be doing as a department or a state board that would be helpful to you in this moment or Dr. Wild as we think and in some ways rethink this type of work? Is there something that you'd like to see us be talking about or doing? It can be overwhelming to have a lot of help. Yeah. And, um, 
One of the things I see us doing is organizing the system for helping us a whole lot better. The commissioner talks a lot about us having support, but he's listened to the request for us to have that to be customized. And I see that push from him. Um, I see even in the development, not fully sure how it all will happen, but all the comments that he shares and everything that they're talking about as we transition into Act 930, um, we, need, uh, we need all the help we can get. Uh, but sometimes, as it was said, you, when you don't know exactly which direction to go and when you kind of decide in the direction, uh, a whole lot of help really is just hard to grab your, get your arms around. So coordinating the services um, is a huge benefit for us. And we have seen that, that more and more and more. So I would say um, that in addition to, believe it or not, ideas. Um, I heard a lot about the Dolly Parton imagination um, piece where you get those books in and that was a conversation in our community some years ago but it hasn't been revived believe it or not I jotted that down and said hey we need to think about sometimes really ideas mm -hmm. are, um, are very useful so I'd have to think about that a whole lot more but I definitely know that the coordination of the services uh, in a customized way to meet us where we are we are not where some other districts are and as we converse about where we should be, that's great, but I can't get there tomorrow. So we have to look at a trajectory, uh, project some steps that we can take, and we've got to celebrate it. Yeah. And any, anything in, in that realm. And I have to say your comments have, as much as it is an emergency, uh, you've been very supportive. And, and, and that's very helpful, very helpful. We appreciate your attitude. Yes, we do. Oh, thank you, Ms. Warren. Dr. Wild, anything you'd like to add, either about um, Dollar Way or about the process? Just want to comment that in systems, you have to get the core curriculum in place first. And I would suggest to you that that has been one of the main foci that for this year was to get that in place. Uh, that's a process. And so, we were better at the end of the year than we were at the beginning of the year in terms of the delivery of core. And so next year, the attention goes to now how to support the core. So it's still continuation. The other component that I would say is, is very important here is we do have to figure out how to stabilize the staff. They continue to have high turnover. Mm -hmm. and, in, and until you stabilize the staff, you don't get that continuity of progress over time. And then the, the, certainly the, they are working already on bringing the community and engaging the community. Uh, at the same time, I would always suggest that you can do more in that area, but you can't do more with the people that are trying to do the core they, they need to do that part, and so you can't overburden them. And so some of this has to be slow and methodical. And while it is an emergency, while it is urgent, we also have to be methodical in how we address the problem or we create more problems. And so that's my whole comment on that. Thank you, Dr. Wild. And one last question for you, Dr. Wild. There's going to be... I think at some point you had spoken about a conference that ha happens every summer with people that are getting support from your unit so that they can share some of these best practices and ideas. Did, yeah. did I misunderstand that? No, uh, actually, yeah, two weeks from now will be okay. the conference in Hot Springs. Could you we kindly send us the information if any of us yes. find ourselves um, in that area? I think maybe it might be interesting for us to just pop our heads in and listen if that's, if that's yeah. not an inconvenience. It, it's not. Okay. And we have about... Uh, at this time, about 600 uh, participants signed oh, wow. up. Um, Mr. Nowak has been working on the logistics and was just in Hot Springs today uh, reviewing the, the rooms and how we would do the placement of, of participants and breakout sessions. And also, I want to highlight Lasagna Johnson, who's been working directly with uh, Dollar Way School District. So they're a team and um, have, I think, um, supported Dollar Way very well and provided a lot of good service there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ables, did you have something to say? Ms. Warren, 
I was just curious if UAPB would do some kind of partnership with you all and do send mentors to come in and read with the kids. I don't maybe you already do that. I'm just asking because I know some of my babies go to UAPB and they're such good kids. And and those your kids need to see those kids Absolutely. and need to see them in college and and see that they're going for their dreams and that they're doing everything that they want to do and just maybe that mentoring piece would be so good not from just an adult or a parent or community leader but a teenager or young adult as well absolutely we do those types of things they come in and read um hang out some of we have these um band, band mentors i don't really know what they're called but they literally come out and help to instruct um, but yes we do have a really good relationship there's more that can be done but it does make a difference for them to see people that look like they could they don't think they look like adults they don't think they'll ever be an adult but yeah 19 year old they feel like they could be that person yes. one day great idea and we and we do some of that yes Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, if there's no more with this report, then one, one last thing. Commissioner, yeah, one, last one. One last thing so that you all can, um, you can know what kind of impact it has with, with, with a, as hard as it is to make a decision for state takeover. Um, I, I, want, I want to give you an example of one of the things where I don't think it could have happened if we hadn't had the relationship now that we have with Ms. Warren and with her team at Dollarway is, is in the area of uh, the workforce stability for that district. Uh, a couple of months ago, you know, we have regular meetings, Ms. Warren and, and our leadership team do, and one of the things I said was, you know, how can we start getting on a path of it increasing salaries, looking at the salary schedule uh, so that we can have uh, some stability or start getting there a and so you know a lot of times it's just looking at how you are used to spend money the things that you were spending money on that you weren't getting anything out of it and you just have to stop and Mrs. Warren ha has done that working with our uh, fiscal support team and where I thought maybe we could look at the seven or the 18 19 school year for uh, an increase on the salary schedule uh, she found a way to make it happen for the 17-18 school year. And if you look at it, it's, it's like, how did, how did that not happen before? You know, because it was just a matter of prioritizing the dollars. And the money was there, it's just, let's stop doing this, let's start doing this. And that process of showing her team that uh, you know, these are things that can happen, I just wanted y'all to know that's one example. There, there are many, but that's one example that you hear about so many times in these districts that have trouble with salaries. Sometimes it's just making decisions to stop doing things that aren't productive. And uh, I, I, I appreciate the work uh, Ms. Warren and, and her team in analyzing and giving us an opportunity to work with her on that. Um, and we're, we're seeing positive results. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Warren, and thank you, Dr. Wild. Um, moving on to our second report from the Little Rock School District, I did want to ask Dr. Wild or the Commissioner, Ms. Kaufman, my understanding was that the Little Rock School District folks maybe were here earlier but had to leave due to the no, they, advisory. They're still here. No, no, they were watching uh, that when it came time for them to be here, they would come over, but their community advisory board began 10 minutes ago. Yes. and. Well, there may not be too much left if we, so my question is uh, with the Little Rock School District, is there a way of picking that up next month instead? Or what would be the preference of Dr. Wilds here? Thoughts on that? I think to just postpone till next month. Yeah. And uh, I think they've done a very uh, thoughtful report and really took a, a look at themselves and uh, to hear some of the ideas of where they're uh, headed in the future, especially with their Achieve Team concept. I think that would be valuable for them to express it. Uh, now, I don't know about their availability, but uh, certainly if we could postpone and, and come back at a future date. 
That um, if there's no concerns from the board here, I, I, my preference would also be to give them the opportunity to be here. And I, I did know that they had the citizen advisory uh, board as well. And then um, Dr. Barth had um, made a, a comment um, during one of the breaks that um, the stakeholders group will have their report by next month as well. So then we may have some additional questions to them after we've heard the stakeholders report. So that I think does seem to make sense um, to um, uh, postpone until till next month. Or well, I'll leave that to the discretion of the next chair. To decide with Ms. Kaufman when that's scheduled, but let's assume next assume month. that if they're if they're available, I think okay. that makes uh, great sense. Okay, thank you. Anyways, thank you, thank you, Dr. Wild. Um, so, with the board's um, discretion, uh, I would like to propose that we do the forward report. I think we may have an opportunity to wrap up here before dinner, if um, if if others feel that that's achievable as well. Um, I know it's been a, a long afternoon, but. Um, and then we'll, we'll just conclude with, there's the ESSA feedback, Ms. Kaufman, um, that uh, they'll, they'll be with the commissioner. Um, so a little bit of conversation there. Um, how long do you think that would take, commissioner? Again, I'm just trying to determine if we break for dinner. Or Dr. Rolla is, is going to call in and uh, to answer questions. So really it depends on how many questions, the questions are. that you all have. That, 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 is, that is, it's kind of, that's his, it's all, the same. it's all the same, as is mine, so our, the only thing is ESSA, so it's forward and ESSA that remains um, with uh, some final thanks at the end um, to Dr. Gocher. So with that, would the board like to proceed and see if we can round this off? All right, let's do it. So with that, uh, Mr. Um, Biggs, welcome back. Thanks. And you are recognized. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Corey Biggs. I'm the Associate Director of Forward Arkansas. Good to be with you again. Uh, I've got uh, just a brief presentation with some highlights uh, and a quick video that I wanted to share with you all. Uh, and then, of course, open for questions. Um, so where we're at right now with the work of Forward is to uh, sort of reevaluate one year in to the implementation of the forward vision, the progress that we've made, uh, knowing that there's still a lot of progress left, but uh, to evaluate the progress that we have made uh, in each of our key focus areas. Um, and I'm just gonna take these uh, in order here with pre-K. Um, you can see that there were a couple of things, and, and also as you look through your folders, you'll see um, some one-pagers about this progress as well. Uh, you'll see that we met a couple of the marks that were in the list of recommendations under pre-K, including uh, marketing the value of pre-K. Uh, we invested a lot of time and energy in that uh, over the course of the last year, and I think um, are starting to break through. You hear a lot of good positive conversation about pre-K at the state level and certainly uh, at the community level. Um, and we advocated for uh, additional pre-K funds that were uh, determined to be needed to meet the quality standards that were contained in the forward recommendations and uh, the governor did a lot three million dollars in additional funding for pre-k um, this year in in the next budget um, and we're uh, happy about that and and still counting on uh, towards uh, future investment in pre-k uh, in supports beyond the classroom you saw there was uh, a lot of momentum around reducing hunger and improving nutrition uh, so we uh, along with our strategic partners the Arkansas Hunger Relief Alliance contributed to 51,000 more students over the last two years receiving healthy meals in school most of those uh, are also transitioning to breakfast after the bell uh, which is great um, and you also see a lot of work around implementing the community eligibility provision which is designed to get more meals uh, at no cost to more students actually to entire schools and entire districts in some cases full of students at no cost to anyone um, we are partnering uh, both with the department as well as uh, providers and nonprofit organizations to figure out um, the best steps forward on school-based health partnerships. There's obviously a ton that is changing, and uh, um, I welcome any questions on that, though that's not, healthcare is not my expertise. <laughs> that's why we're still learning a lot on that. 
uh, and we're partnering for effective after school and summer programs as well and uh, I think that you see uh, some momentum around that still no state funding that's been dedicated towards that um, and and that's something that I think is a long-term dream of uh, many of the partners that we have with forward but um, we are certainly supportive in our forward communities of effective after school and summer programs and have brought them in to play a key role um, in teaching and learning uh, have to pat uh, the governor and the commissioner and the staff here at the department on the back for uh, the increased emphasis that's been placed on early literacy and uh, reading on grade level by the end of third grade uh, and that's something that, that certainly uh, we're supportive of and through our partnership with the Arkansas Campaign for Grade Level Reading continue to do work on, uh, as well as, as a new strategic partnership, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. And that's something that we're trying to bring to all of our communities, especially those that don't already have that in place. Uh, and also collaborating on college and career readiness initiatives, which is something that uh, a couple of our communities are doing very well. And that's something that uh, we would like to see spread, not just to the other forward communities, but across the state as well. Uh, this re-envisioning of what it means to, uh, to think about uh, not the old VOTEC path versus college going path, but to have options to be able to go get a job right out of school as well as having some college credit under your belt already uh, and being able to uh, complete a four year degree later on if you want to and, and being able to, to have multiple on and off ramps to any career. Um, and with that, um, that's a perfect lead in to the community's work that we're doing. We've engaged uh, formal leadership groups across all five of our forward communities, Cross it, Independence County, Lee County, Pea Ridge, and Springdale. And uh, I feel like, you know, we're a year in and it took a little while for uh, all of those folks to uh, grapple with the idea that we were a group of people that were coming in from uh, Little Rock with support from a uh, state agency and a uh, big Little Rock based foundation and a big foundation from Northwest Arkansas but that we weren't coming telling we were coming to listen and uh, that we were really interested in what the needs of each specific community were and what we could do from a guidance standpoint to help lead them to solutions that they could create on their own and take ownership of uh, but I think we've we've turned that corner now and I think that um, we've seen a lot of progress on that and we've got uh, some plans that are all coming into onto paper now uh, that we'll have by the fall. So I'm um, really excited about that. I think that's going to continue to be uh, the major focus of our work as we go forward uh, with a, a strong base to build from now. We did have our first forward thinking conference which I think we were getting ready to have the last time I visited with you all uh, at the end of March. And uh, it was held in Batesville, which is one of our forward communities. Uh, at the end of March, we, it was the first time we brought together uh, representatives from all five of those places, as well as some other places around the state uh, that we've started to engage with. And uh, it was an opportunity for us to sort of break down some of the silos that uh, we have, especially regional silos that we have across the state, and to make sure that these good ideas have an opportunity to start spreading. Um, and Kim, are we set up for the video? Okay. Wanted to share some of the highlights from that with you all. I see this conference as a first step in um, what we're trying to do. It's a critical part of forward. There's so many people that uh, are so know so much and uh, can can help us. So the excitement of this conference is the opportunity to share ideas, best practices, and to join together with resources from other communities to be able to replicate the practices that are here. I think my favorite part of being here so far is talking to people who all have a passion for education. So I would characterize the experience of the Forward Thinking Conference as surprising. So we've had um, great panels from speakers from all of the forward communities. I was so encouraged by the stories at Southside and Batesville and just to hear the speakers assembled from higher ed through community partners to the, the trip to Bad Boy Mowers and the opportunity to ride one of the mowers in, in the facility. Each of the experiences that have been crafted for us today as part of forward thinking have really stretched us to think about 
um, what we can do to help education be more outside the box. We have work to do. I think all schools have work to do, but we focus on each kid individually. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about high-quality pre-K programs in Springdale or the wraparound services that they have for a very diverse community there, or whether you're talking about revolutionary college and career readiness programs in Pea Ridge as well as right here in Independence County, we've seen a lot of successes in all of our forward communities already. Each one is a little different, but each one of them is experiencing some success of their very own. I think one of the biggest challenges in education is we've made it complicated. We've made a very complicated business and a part of the challenge is trying to remove barriers and make it easier for school districts to do what they want to do. Well, the, the vision of Forward Arkansas is for every student to graduate from high school ready for college or career and to be successful in their own right. And we want the communities of Arkansas to be involved and invested from day one. We want to change the statistics. We want to flip the numbers and change Arkansas's achievement from where it is now to one of the top states in the country. And I really believe we're going to do that. So but it's going to be hard work. All students can succeed. Yeah, they can, but how do you make that happen? How do you build that? Because where this can go from here, the potential is limitless, but the heart and the will to do is strong. So it's very encouraging to have an opportunity to, to participate in such an innovative and uh, life-changing program for Arkansas. For a student to already start their uh, career plan in the ninth grade and then possibly have a job offer on the table, you know, once they graduate from high school. The successes I think we see every day, we see it in that lightning moment where, these, where you see children and, and young people uh, where they really are excited about what they're doing and they really um, are learning. And I think that's what keeps us going. Well, we want people to go to the website at www.forwardarkansas.org and really learn about who we are and what we're doing and then commit to moving forward. I mean, uh, we want them to click that button. We don't have all the answers. We haven't figured all that out yet. So we want them to do that and figure out how, 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 we, how to get involved. We also want other communities to say, hey, we want to do this, you know. Um, we want to become a forward community. Adopt us. Thinking Conference 2017. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, the commissioner and, and the department for uh, allowing uh, some staff to attend that Forward Thinking Conference. I think that was great to have that connection there. Uh, and also uh, just wanted to draw your attention to the trip that we took to Bad Boy Mowers because that was a, a specific highlight and it ties directly back into uh, one of the slides from earlier in the presentation that there was a, a young man who actually led that tour. Uh, he was 21 years old. And he told a, a very moving story about when he was a freshman in high school and um, he was ready to drop out because he just didn't have anything that interested him going on at the high school. That was around the same time that Southside High School was beginning a partnership with the University of Arkansas Community College at Batesville and Bad Boy Mowers. Uh, for uh, their high school students to be able to attend classes uh, to count towards their high school diploma, but to attend them on the campus of UACCB, to take a, a south side bus over there, uh, to also be progressing towards an associate's degree at the same time while they were in high school, and to obtain a welding certificate by the time they were done. And to get an apprenticeship sponsored by Bad Boy Mowers simultaneously so that they could learn the high-tech welding and the equipment that they have at Bad Boy. And that young man was able to get a job at 18 right out of high school uh, with an associate's degree in his pocket and he was able to buy a home at 19. He was the first person ever in his family to own a home. Uh, and not only does he have a good job now, uh, but they also have a partnership in place now for Southside graduates that if they want to go on and, and obtain a four-year degree on top of what they've already done, they can do that through Lyon College. Uh, at a reduced rate. So say 10, 15 years down the road, if that young man has an opening to uh, move into a, a management role, uh, 
you know, dream come true job for anybody in the state of Arkansas, uh, he's right there and he's got the option to do that. That's what I was talking about with on and off ramps for these careers. So uh, I thought that was really powerful to have him actually lead that tour and, and to, to have representatives from all five of our forward communities be exposed to that. Um, with systems and policies being the last piece, um, we are happy uh, to have seen Act 930 passed into law and that uh, the rules will soon be in place to uh, outline the details of that, but to have um, codified what was one of the original forward recommendations, which was the creation of a pre-academic distress um, status. Of course, we're doing away with all of those labels now, which I think is good, and we're moving to a system of positive support for all schools, uh, and we're, we're very excited to help play a role in that. Um, and again, just want to thank the department for um, the strong relationship that we've built up there. Uh, but I think the, uh, the way that I'll close and then open it up to questions is um, as we're sort of doing this work on our progress and seeing where we're at, and we're getting to a place where we've got things on paper in each of our communities, uh, our focus is, is going to be on that vision, uh, which was unanimously adopted by the State Board uh, at the very beginning of this process, which outlines the strength of the Forward Initiative being um, this, you know, I won't call it a plan, I'll call it a vision, because it's, it's just recommendations after all, but it is a to-do list for places that want to find success, no matter where they're at and no matter what resources they've had available, um, you can get started. And for our forward communities particularly, we're in this for the long haul and we're there to help twist every arm that we can and uh, you know, make this happen. Whatever resources that we can shake loose in this state, we think that we've got more than enough here to help all of our people. We just, uh, as Ms. Warren was saying, we need good systems in place and we need strong people who are in it for the long haul. And uh, so that's, that's us, <laughs> that's what we're committed to. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Biggs. And um, uh, just to connect the dots, um, uh, thank you for connecting us with Ms. Uh, Dickey as well. She uh, joined us once again for a work session today and we'll be following up with you. Um, we know you all are doing your own conversations on community and parent engagement and that's yes. the bookmarker for our, our work for this year at the very least, um, uh, but obviously wrote ahead. So we're hoping to see where synergies might lie and uh, she'll be reaching out to you and Susan uh, for an invitation of a meeting so that we can sit down and do a crosswalk in our notes and see if there might be some opportunities ahead. Um, but with that, any yeah, questions or uh, comments, Ms. Sook? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I wonder, I know you have a, with, in Dollar Way, you have a, a partnership with the Rural Community Alliance. I wonder if you could get them and the Arkansas Campaign for Grade Level Reading and the Hunger Relief Alliance and the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, your partnerships there, and get something going in Dollar Way this summer. Uh, yes, I think we can. Um, they, we need, they need... Uh, uh, extra help down there yes and uh, if you could do that that'd be great yes we're, Thank you. we're very committed to helping dollar way and um, they had some representatives at our conference as well so uh, through that and, and our support of the work that RCA is doing and uh, our very interested observances of the go forward Pine Bluff plan I think that there is a lot of good stuff happening I want to add my applause to uh, what you all uh, shared for Ms. Warren earlier and for the things that are going on in that community. But um, you're right uh, that there are some, I think, low-hanging fruit for things that, that we can leverage our strategic partnerships with and get some good stuff done ASAP. Thank you, Mr. Biggs. Additional questions or comments? No, then thank you for that, and thank you. Um, and we again appreciate the the partnership and keeping us informed, and look forward to seeing where things go ahead. So thank you so much, thank and congratulations you. on all the success of this last year. Thank you. So with that, uh, we have now. Is that? Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, so with that, we've now uh, concluded our reports, um, uh, at least from our, our outside colleagues, and now uh, the opportunity to end off today on ESSA and uh, ESSA feedback. Um, I believe, is it Dr. Ariola that will be calling in to answer questions? Uh, was everybody able to review the materials that Ms. Kaufman sent around? Um, this is really our, our opportunity to be able to, to make those inquiries. Um, and I don't know what technology has been made for Dr. Ariola. Is she on the line? 
it's over here, but I don't know how to operate it. Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm not sure. I know it's end of the day. Everyone's uh, gone. Sure I know how to operate. <laughs> I think that's one of Dr. Pfeiffer's new assignments, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, y'all are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that sounds like somebody joining in. Denise. You'll take all the credit, right, Commissioner? <laughs> you hear us, Denise? I'm with you. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Ariola. Welcome uh, to the State Board meeting. Um, this is Mireya Reif, and um, we're we're glad to have you on. You are. Our, our book end for a long day um, so I'm uh, but we appreciate you you joining us so that we can um, ask questions we know all the hard work that's been done thus far um, for everybody's purposes um, this is the email that was sent by Miss Kaufman on May 31st entitled preparation for the State Board of Education June 8th um, and the attachment there um, and I open it up with that to the board unless um, Dr. Arioli if, there, if there's um, any comments you would like to begin with otherwise um, I know that we're opening it up for questions um, no comments except that I'm, I'm happy to answer questions that I might have the answer to and I'll, I'll let you know if I don't <laughs> thank you yes uh, Dr. Barth hi Denise how are you I'm good thank you um, so um, I, and I did seen, send uh, a number of comments to to Miss Smith, um, and uh, but just a uh, I would I would appreciate uh, your thoughts on this. I had I guess three three real areas of concern uh, uh, in in a uh, and I should note that lots and lots and lots of of wonderful stuff in in this plan, and so uh, these are these are are minor critiques and questions uh, in what is a, I think a great. Uh, a great uh, uh, game plan that everyone uh, has worked on. Um, I did have some concern on the in size front, um, and a couple of a couple of things there. Um, you know, I do have um, uh, some concern about um, students being um, being lost with an in size of 15 on the accountability side. And then I also have some concerns about confusion that may result from differences between an in, uh, different end sizes for accountability and for reporting purposes. And whether, I think one thing that we have really tried to do over the last few years is try to, try to get the number of, of measures that are communicated to the broader public reduced rather than enlarged because we've got so many different letter grades and categorizations etc and so I, I worry a little bit about that differentiation between an in size of 15 for accountability in size of, of 10 for reporting and so could you just speak a little bit about that your thoughts there I, I can I can um, uh, let me let me talk about the reporting versus the accountability uh, first because that is one um, you're, you're probably aware that under NCLB and under the ESEA flexibility waivers, we had an end size of 25 for accountability and a reporting end size of 10. Um, so we've had that difference before. The drop down to 15 that is being proposed does capture um, many more students than we were capturing before. It covers more schools and it, it, it does capture more students in the statewide accountability system. One of the things that I was just thinking about in terms of the N of 15 for accountability versus the N of 10 for reporting <clears throat> is, um, you know, you could come at it from a statistical soundness argument, but the truth is that 15 and 10, it's hard to make an argument that those are statistically sound. It's more about the state wanting to make sure as many students as possible are, are captured in the system um, while also protecting student privacy. There are going to be differences in 
how data are reported for reporting purposes in the annual school report card based on some changes in the law that are part of ESSA. So while we're trying to intentionally minimize some of the confusion, there are going to be um, places where the law kind of sets us up for that anyway. One of those is that <clears throat> the law does call out some very specific differences for accountability versus reporting. Um, my, the, the example that I think has, the, has me most concerned and we really can't, I don't know that we can do anything about this um, because it's how it's written in the law. In the law, students who do not complete a full academic year do not get included in accountability. That's specified in there. But the state now, and so in, in years past, um, that was the case. So they, the students, who we call them mobile students, who did not complete a full academic year were not, were not included in the accountability calculations. And then they were not reported in the calculations that then um, went into the school report card. Under ESSA, the change is under, for the accountability, you can continue to exclude mobile students, students who are not enrolled in the school for a full academic year for the purposes of annually differentiating schools. But for reporting purposes, <laughs> we have to include students who are mobile. So there, there will be some slight differences there already in addition to the end size differences. I don't, I don't know that that makes it any better. I, I do know that um, we have had this difference in the accountability end versus the reporting end. And um, we will have this new difference between who's included for accountability versus who's reported in the report card. The, the minimum end is one of those areas where we do have a competing tension. Um, you know, there's, there's the push to include as many students as possible in a meaningful way. And then on the other, the competing tension with that is the concern that you might be identifying schools or subgroup performance where that end size, where that has an undue influence, where it's a small proportion of the, of the population. Um, and so that's where I think 15 came in, was where everybody found that comfort zone, and that's why that's in the proposal. Um, there's a, some options for the English language progress that are in the draft that I think have some potential, there's some big differences between the options and how they allow us to make sure that our proportion of English learners in our school populations has a proportionate impact on the overall um, performance rating that would be used to differentiate schools annually and also um, identify the required um, categories for support. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just to share with the board, um, and, and Dr. Ariola, you may um, be able to elaborate on that. I know that the Arctisol, the Arkansas um, uh, TESOL, Teachers of English as a Second Language, has taken quite seriously what, what you've talked about, the, the options um, for uh, measuring English language progress. And I know Springdale School District is planning to, um, as part of that, and, and have even approached me on that, uh, to help do some focus groups in July. I think part of the questionnaire is how do we empower parents enough to have um, and have the ability to give some information to this, acknowledging that there's a, a whole lot of expertise that goes into what you do, Dr. Ariola, and um, and and you know, getting people up to speed is just not an, an option. But how do we give them enough tools and resources to get informed? And so uh, we've been doing some thinking about that, and I look forward to accompanying the Springdale School District in July in that process. Um, but uh, we've been hearing this in a few different places, and just to share with my colleagues in both roles uh, that I have, I, I hope to be able to support um, the department in getting the type of feedback that you're looking for. Great. Any other questions? Just, Dr. Barr. Just one more question on, um, and I really, on the um, so-called fifth indicator, the non-academic um, um, measures, I mean, I really like the notion of, of over time growing that and making it a more fulsome um, 
measure as more uh, uh, more high quality um, um, uh, indicators come online. Um, I guess I'm I'm a little. I, I want us to be a little careful. I think we know we have been frustrated at times over the last few years with the continually changing measure year to year uh, on the test score front. And so um, I would just kind of advocate for as much stability as possible in, in that so that that indicator isn't changing a lot year to year. Because I think then we really run into apples to, uh, questions of whether we're comparing apples to apples. So what I would really advocate is maybe having a stable three year say these are going to be the, the, the parts, the things that are included in this measure for the first three years, while during that three year do, doing some piloting uh, in districts around the state, but not including it for accountability, and then, uh, and then doing another three years after that, so that we have, I think three years feels like the right kind of, uh, of gauge that we have uh, stability in, our, in, all of our, in all of our measures uh, across the board. So that, that's just one, one thought there, but I really like uh, where that's headed. I do think, and I sent Ms. Smith uh, a couple of other ideas of things that I think might be uh, worth looking at that are, that are out there. So, and my, my final comment was really about um, um, my concerns about the, the, the absence of conversation about the social sciences uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the plan. Um, obviously, the, vi the department's vision does talk about being prepared to uh, be um, effective citizens, and the plan itself really is pretty silent on, on the social sciences. And so I, I think that uh, um, between draft one and draft two, we saw some real improvement in terms of um, uh, discussion of the natural sciences, but I would like to see um, uh, us taking uh, more, uh, being more conscious about the social sciences, especially as we think about um, 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 a whole child education. Uh, and there's some really specific stuff about computer science and other things that as, as would be expected, but, but I think we can, if we can do more to, to talk about the social sciences, especially as it relates to being prepared for citizenship, I think that would improve the, the plan and more importantly, tie it back to the vision of the department um, in that area. Thank you, Dr. Barth. Um, yes, Dr. Ariola. I was just going to say, I, I th this is, you know, I, I, did, I did see the written comments and thought they were all very helpful and very thoughtful. And, um, you know, we, ha we're, we have to start somewhere. And, and I, um, you know, the, the hardest question I think to answer when it comes to that fifth indicator is there are a lot of things that people have, have hoped for. Um, and, when you start to apply the criteria of, you know, how are we measuring it? Is it reliable? Is it valid? Is it comparable? Um, that's why we ended up in the second draft having to say, there's this first set that we think we can calculate right now. And then there are other sets that might take more time. I loved the idea, we, we think alike in this, in that um, as the state considers adding these other indicators are changing how that fifth indicator is done. I think it's very wise to pilot at the district level within that local cycle of inquiry, have people familiar with that data as it's being collected in a more informal way, dry running it. And in some cases, you know, stakeholders might come back and say, you know what, we really don't want this to be part of the accountability measure because we think it'll change the nature of how we use it and right now we're getting a lot out of it. I think this is a learning process for all of us in thinking about other types of ways to measure school quality and student success and um, the civic and community engagement components. While I know that we've done some serious thinking about what that could look like uh, in terms of measuring it to inform the vision and the goals, um, going from thinking about it, what's available, what isn't available, and how we would collect it, to moving it into a place where it would become part of an accountability measure. Um, I think there's a, a good process that's been started with the way that the department has taken stakeholder input, vetted it through 
um, what can we do right now, what data do we have, and what can we pilot as, as we go. And I think that that stakeholder informed process is, is slated to continue. I think it's going to be very, very helpful. So hopefully we'll see some of these additional pieces um, being piloted and then where there's the will for it and the desire for it added in later. I also think that in terms of your concerns about the stability, I very, very much agree with you. Um, it is possible on the reporting side, there are some states who are um, finding a way to have districts upload information that they're collecting locally that they do want to share with the general public. And that's um, one way of then soft dry, doing a soft dry run of what it would look like to add those data. So, you know, thinking even three years down the line, if we were to add additional pieces to the fifth indicator, to that school quality student success indicator, we would still want to be able to show schools how their data before that is comparable to the data with it. So, so um, helping them to see the, the changes in the components that are so critical while they get um, acclimated to the additional information that might be included. So making sure that that continuum of comparable information is always available to help inform actions and decisions is, is going to be really critical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barth. Any final questions or comments? Ms. Sook? If there's not any, I want to compliment Denise um, on the work she's done on this, but I also want to compliment her on the work she did with the South of the River group. Uh, she took a group that was not an easy group. Some of them brought in some pretty strong preconceived notions about and very little knowledge about education, what was going on, and she was very patient with them. She gave them a lot of information and uh, did as good a job as a person could do. And I do compliment you, Denise, and appreciate you very much. Well, well thank you. I, I appreciate those remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Ariolo. Um, hearing nothing else, then I think we're done with the reporting section of today. Um, and we appreciate you, and we know this will be an ongoing conversation, Ms. Newton, and you'll hold us accountable to that. Um, I know you will. And Ms. Kaufman as well, uh, both in this role and I know in her new role. Um, so with that, um, transitions uh, coming ahead. I'm sorry, y'all. There was a time where um, recognitions, uh, chairs, um, it was in our last year. Um, uh, now we're off cycle and we'll probably remain that way for some time to come. Uh, the tradition used to be just a breakfast and a farewell, a photo that was signed. And um, I'm not quite sure what Ms. Kaufman or the commissioner has planned here, um, except I know I, I definitely want to make sure we acknowledge Deputy Commissioner Dr. Gocher amongst all. It's uh, really sad to think that this is the last board meeting he's going to be at. Um, and then I know that changes to come where um, Dr. Barr said, you know, stability. Ms. Abels uh, will be um, taking her seats uh, down, down there, but we're still here, we hope. Um, same with Ms. Kaufman, who's played such a tremendous role up here. Finally, we got her up here seated with us. And then now it's uh, to have you sit back down there. Um, and so it's, it's just been a humbling honor to serve with this team as it is. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, Ms. Kaufman or Commissioner, uh, how you would want to handle this final section as we round off today. Well, first, um, I did ask Mark if he would want to share a few words. And since his audience is so big now. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. not, not many people have to work overtime to get recognized. Yes. <laughs> so if we could start. Mark, go ahead and come on up, and then, uh, and then we'll address Madam Chair. Uh, after you're finished. Thank you, Commissioner. The audience I wanted to address is right in front of me. So, folks, I just want to thank you. When I was invited to be Deputy Commissioner a couple of years ago, first of all, I was honored that Johnny Key would even think of trusting a two-year superintendent. But he saw something in me. I saw something in, in him. And I feel like we've had a beautiful partnership. We've become great friends. We've enjoyed leading together. Um, I appreciate his trust in letting me um, be a part of such a fantastic team. And so I'm grateful to you, Johnny. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. When I think of 
just a couple of weeks left, it's, uh, it's, it's very sad. And I've, I've said this often that there are very few districts in this state that would take me away from working with Johnny Key and this wonderful leadership team. And the hometown kind of, kind of pulls, doesn't it? So, and he knew this day would come at some point, maybe not at Russellville, but at some point. And so I want to tell the board, thank you for your leadership. Madam Chair, thank you so much. I look forward to working with you in Russellville as we've talked about some of those conversations. I think that'll be great. And Dr. Barth, I wish you well this next year. Who knows, I may be coming with all these wonderful, <laughs> innovative <laughs> ideas and uh, asking the board to grant Russellville School District some 1240 waivers to, uh, for, the, for the sake of those wonderful students there. But I just want to... Uh, just close and just say thank you for the opportunity, the lessons I've learned in this state and in this nation that will benefit my new journey. Um, I had no idea the, uh, the amount of learning that would take place. And I said this yesterday to Commissioner, I wish every superintendent could just spend 30 days, 30 days, take a leave of absence. And I asked Commissioner how many superintendents could he handle. He said, one at a time. <laughs> so, and I understand that. But... I'm most excited about the next chapter of the Deputy Commissioner. I'm a big fan of Dr. Ivy Pfeffer, and I am so proud of her and looking forward to being a superintendent under her leadership. I know she will do a great job, and I'm, I'm excited about the days ahead. We've got many things changing, but it's always good because we always seem to fill in the gap. And, and uh, anyway, I just want to close by saying thank you, thank you, and thank you. Kim, you missed your cue to uh, turn on the applause sound effect back there <laughs> to make to it amplify. sound like there was uh, a large <laughs> group. First thing in the morning. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, time, the two years we've had together have been fantastic. Uh, we uh, laughed together, cried together, uh, asked a lot of hard questions to each other and, and hard questions to our team and hard questions to uh, the folks that we work with out in the schools. and. Uh, just to, to challenge ourselves on the direction we're headed and uh, it's been a great partnership and I look forward to the um, uh, it'll be it'll continue to be a partnership it'll just be in in a new role so uh, this won't I'm sure this won't be his last board meeting uh, because I'm sure he will be back because he's someone that I did expect that this day would come I didn't expect it to be after two years I thought it might be after three, four, five years, uh, and then Mr. Williams decided to just up and retire. So, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those things that the two years I'll cherish, uh, it's, um, you know, what I needed at the time, Mark provided. And uh, just really can't say enough about his leadership, the way he handles himself in difficult situations uh, the, the way he handles himself in not difficult situations. I mean, it's, he's, he's steady. And uh, as a leader, somebody who is steady is worth their weight in gold. So uh, look forward to the great things that are going to happen in Russellville under his leadership. And thank you for being my right hand for the last two years. So now we'll uh, get to Madam Chair, and this is unusual because typically we, at the end of someone's uh, period of, of, you know, the, of having the chair, we are sending them off uh, to uh, some rest. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's a little odd because uh, Ms. Rice is going to remain with us uh, for another year after this. Uh, so it's a little different, and uh, we'll celebrate her career on the board but right now we just want to celebrate her year as chair and I think during this year she has certainly brought a uh, a perspective that helped us as a department uh, she uh, again in the, the, the area of challenging us in our thinking and, and helping us look at um, what we do in a different light and making sure that you know the students at uh, uh, all of our students are 
being considered in the decision making. Uh, the story that she brings, you know, we we learn more we learn more about her this morning that I didn't know, uh, and we see how uh, someone that sits in a role of leadership like this and the experiences that they bring shapes and molds and helps direct policy and helps direct uh, the the state in its role. So, uh, just personally, I uh, express my deep appreciation. Uh, You've helped put us on a national map, um, and I know that your dedicated service and work with NASB is something that's uh, uh, certainly going to continue to live and uh, helps move the state in the right direction. When we talk about leading, leading the nation in student-focused education, we can't do that by ourselves as a department. Uh, it takes strong leadership at the, at the board level, and bringing those experiences, bringing your perspective has been a blessing to all of us. And uh, so personally, I don't have anything to hand you <laughs> except uh, just to express my appreciation uh, on behalf of the department and look forward to the, the next year and continue our work together. And I know Dr. Barth actually does have something he would like to present to you. And um, to, we will obviously celebrate all, all seven years of your service uh, in a year, um, but, um, but we're here to, to thank you for your year of service as chair, and we know that it was, it was a, a challenging year as we had a lot of transitions on this board, um, but we know that uh, you really were thoughtful and caring about every, every, every meeting and every, uh, every work session. Uh, that we had and uh, so you ha there is a letter uh, from signed by us um, thanking you for your service as chair of the state board uh, from July tw 2016 to June 2017 during your tenure the board has conducted several work sessions to examine deeper learning your leadership has resulted in focused conversations on providing equitable access to resources rigor and educational experiences that ensure deeper learning in Arkansas classrooms we appreciate your dedication and contribution to all students in Arkansas and I want to highlight the fact that you have always thought about um, the, 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 the role that we should play to ensure that all students have, um, have access to high quality education, including uh, students who have so often been ignored um, and, uh, and, and invisible. And you have, uh, you have created visibility in places that uh, visibility didn't historically ex exist. And I have seen on, a, on several occasions where um, young men and women, um, many of them Latino, but many of them not, who are really inspired by you. And there are going to be a lot more folks. This, this board is going to continue to be um, a lot more diverse, and, and there are going to be voices that deserve to have a voice on this board and in leadership roles all over the state for years to come. And so thank you for your year of service. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm without words, I think I said what I, I needed to this morning, and I know that um, this has gone on, but I, again, um, it's, um, my, my dad always told me, you, you can't take it with you, it's what you do with your life when you're here, so that's the motto. It's um, him and his untimely death that brought me back to Arkansas, and it's what I've tried to live by um, ever since, so, and um, I just, I, I, I love my state so much. Um, you know, here I was dedicating a life to helping others try and find their leadership path. I never expected anyone would point the finger back at me <laughs> and say, what can you give? And I think that's just such a testament to Arkansas and to everybody. Um, and I have to say ditto to Dr. Gocher, right? Um, seeing potential in me um, that I guess I didn't even know was there. And so just thankful to everyone um, and for all the long days, um, including today. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like the appropriate way of ending it. Um, a, a long, tiresome day, but um, an accomplished day. And I, I can't think of any better way um, to conclude. And, uh, and I'm grateful I'll continue to be able to have a presence, but I'm also grateful, like I said, knowing that the board's going to be in such good hands. And um, with a, both, both dear friends as, as leaders, um, and with our continued commissioner and his team. And um, we have a little, 
um, hopscotching amongst positions, but I'm glad to see the core <laughs> is uh, in, in many ways still going to be there. And as Dr. Bars challenged all of us to continue to work together, um, and I think we will, and we'll continue to accomplish great things. So I am not going to keep you all any longer from dinner um, and for today, and uh, and just ask for my final motion of adjournment. Um, yeah, do yes, thing. yes, Ms. Newton. I, I want to recognize yes, Ms. Megan uh, before yes, we do, yes, because yeah. uh, this is her last yes, uh, board meeting as a teacher of the year. She has done an outstanding job from the very moment that I first read that initial application. She stood head and shoulders above the rest. You could feel her passion that she has for her students and for Arkansas. And I, I don't. I don't know that there could ever be another teacher of the year like <laughs> Megan. And, and, and you know, and she she came through and she has served our state well. She served the teachers of our state well. She served our students well. And and I'm very very proud of you. Um, you were our teacher of the year, but I get to call you my friend too. Oh, yes. So with uh, Miss Tears, <laughs> um, do I have a motion of adjournment? Do I have a second? Motion made by Miss Sook, seconded by Dr. Barth. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all.